Hello, my name is Matthew. Hello, my name is Rain. And we're with the Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library. Uh, welcome to Dr. Julian Chambliss. Hi, Julian. Hello. Um, so I'm actually going to turn off my camera uh, now and have Rain take it away. Welcome, you guys. We're very happy that you have decided to join us today. So first up, we wanted to talk about our summer reading challenge that's happening with the Hillsborough County Libraries. And Beanstack is uh, where you can go to kind of learn more and you can start tracking your reading. So it is hcplc.beanstack.org. So take a look and join us in our summer reading challenge. Today, we wanted to talk about uh, some of our, you know, what, our, what we're going to do this awesome presentation. It's Rocket, Raccoon, and Mighty Marvel Animals with Dr. Julian Chamberlain. So thank you again, Dr. Chamberlain, for being, Chamberlain, for being here. We're really excited um, to see what you have to teach us about these awesome comics. I'm not necessarily super an expert on comics, so I'm excited to learn from you. So Awesome. So I'm gonna. Um, so real quickly, we're gonna do a, a quick shout out before we go to. to we're gonna. I'm gonna hand it over to you. So the shout out is it's it's Slugfest inside the epic 50 year battles between Marvel and DC by Reed Tucker, and that's available on our Libby app. So you can download that on any of your, any of your mobile devices and go ahead and read that uh, to find that book, just head over to HCPLC slash books. Okay. And now we are going to oh. hand it all off to you and, and teach us everything that we should know. Okay. So I'm going to get in presenter mode here. I'll make sure I start my timer. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity to share our uh, with you a little bit about Marvel Comics. As um, you already know, my name is Julian Chambers. I'm a professor of English. I'm also the Val Behrman Curator of History at the MSU Museum at Michigan State University. If you're interested in following me on Twitter, I'm at Julian Chambers. I'm going to try to keep it simple. Uh, this presentation is about Rocket Raccoon. I was happy to take the opportunity, as always, to talk about superhero comics and their presentation. And Rocket, let's face it, is a unlikely icon in part because of his success being integrated in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But of course, the original Rocket does come from the comics. And for those of you who are fans of comics, you might have known about this character from his debut in the early 1980s in Hulk number 271. But this actually isn't the first time that Rocket was introduced. Rocket first appeared in 1976. He was created by uh, creator Bill Mantello and Keith Giffen. These are two creators that have a long list of very impressive credits, but they actually introduced Rocket and Marvel Presents um, from uh, 1976. And this is a magazine style black and white that introduced the character in a one-off story uh, on the cover is actually Santana, which is a very not necessarily like kids-friendly uh, uh, character. And in fact, the character that was Rocket, as you can see from these panels, was actually sort of presented in the context of a kind of sword and sorcery kind of story. It was very common in these magazine stories. This was a time where Conan, for instance, was very big in, in Marvel Comics. They had the license to that. This is a character that is talking. It's not necessarily sort of um, presented in the same sort of, at some level, comedic way that we will come to associate with the character when he's introduced in the Marvel mainstream universe in part because of the format of being black and white, also in part because the accepted readership of the magazine formats tended to be more adult at the time. And so the character uh, is a sort of talking, talking animal. He's a raccoon. In fact, the creators did name the character after a Beatles song. If you know the Beatles, you know there's a, there's a, there's a Beatles song that talks about Rocket Raccoon. And this is in fact a, a character that's talked a little bit of an English accent and does sort of allude to the fact that well, he's not a raccoon. He may look like one, but he isn't. Uh, and the adventures in this story almost don't a, a, at all associate with the version that we know so well. So um, as you see here, he says, talks about, he's talking to the, this character, like, you know, let's go get something to eat, old bean, that kind of thing. 
when we think about Rocket, I think it's important to think about that its introduction in the 1980s or the 1980s as very being very much within the context of a kind of formulaic uh, success that was common to Marvel Comics at the time period. This was a a a, a period of formulaic success in part because of the leadership of Jim Shooter, who was the editor at the time. He was the third editor of Marvel Comics behind Stan Lee and uh, Roy Thomas. Shooter was very much interested in making sure that the sort of pattern that we associate with, with telling Marvel stories, making it accessible to as many readers as possible. He, he did a lot to try to crystallize the formula that he associated with Marvel Comics. One of the things he always talked about that any person who opened a book a Marvel book should be able to immediately understand who the characters were and, and understand where, where they were in the story. And so one of the sort of tweaks that you might find from comics of this period is that a lot of characters say who they are and sort of like recap the story very quickly in the opening panels of almost every story. But that formula meant that he was very cognizant of the opportunity to introduce different readers to Marvel Comics. So he's always looking for opportunities to sort of expand on what was possible in terms of Marvel. And Rocket Raccoon, in this context, makes a lot of sense. He actually introduces in the page of Incredible Hulk, which is one of the really popular comics of the period. And in the story, the Hulk is sort of sent to this distant part of the universe, and he's introduced to Rocket and his world. And here, the character is closer to what the character that we know what he looks like. He's a talking animal. He's a, a raccoon. He has guns. He's a freedom fighter, but that freedom fight is in the context of the specialized sort of almost comedic world that is the Keystone Quadrant. And in that first issue in The Incredible Hulk, the backstory that sort of defines the character in this early period is, is introduced you find out that Rocket is from the special part of the universe that's walled off called the Keystone Quadrant. He lives on this place called Half World. Half World is actually divided between uh, robots that were created by we're not sure who. And these robots were created to take care of a human population that lives on this planet that will become Half World. They don't really wanna do that. So they, they actually evolve animals into sort of talking sentient beings so they can take care of the humans and they can go off on the other part of the planet and start building machines like they want to. And one of the uh, machines they're building is this giant ship called Ship, a humanoid spacecraft called Ship. And they're building that to eventually escape this planet. The adventures that are presented in this story are very much sort of sword and sorcerer elements. Uh, Rocket is, uh, leader of uh, a kind of freedom fighter fighting against a kind of evil force in the Keystone Quadrant. He has a ship called Rack and Ruin, and he has a girlfriend, and he, he's fighting against a sort of evil manipulative figure who's looking for something called uh, the Gideon Bible, which is supposed to tell people the secrets of, of, of Half World. And so as you can see, this sort of like lay out a very sort of like whimsical, at some, at some level, fantastical story it's really designed to appeal to a wide swath of potential comic readers. Um, the bad guy here is uh, this, this uh, Judson Jakes, who's a, a sort of like evil, um, I'm not even sure what kind of animal this is, sort of platypus, I think that's platypus. And a lot of the adventures in this story are about this fight between Rocket and this evil animal. In some ways, this is, a incredibly out, out, of the, out of the ballpark story for this period. In other ways, it makes perfect sense because one of the things that Rocket is trying to do uh, is, is sort of protect, right? And so he's a hero in a sort of special part of the world. He actually gets Hulk's help to defeat, defeat at the machinations of his protagonist. Um, the character will get revamped and sort of reimagined in a, in a limited series a few years later. So I think he sort of introduced it in 1982 and about around 1984-85, he gets his own sort of uh, mini series. Here, the art is a little bit better. Um, the still set in the key, Keystone Quadrant, but the sword and sorcery, the animal adventures, all of that gets a little bit better refined. But this is really uh, not kids friendly material. As you can see, this sort of dangerous clown's gonna kill this sort of animal scientist. 
so on and so forth. At some level, when I think about Rocket in this period, as I say, this is part of a moment where Marvel Comics is really trying to broaden every way possible its pool of readership. This is a, a really important period in terms of comic, the rise of the direct market means they have a lot of very skilled, very understanding comic book readers who are looking for more from their comic books. At the same time, Marvel's also taken on a lot of contract work and they've done some really, they do some really defining work. They, they create the, um, the story of G.I. Joe that was actually Marvel Comics. They were hired by Hasbro to do that. They have a long running license to Star, Star Wars. They also create the sort of backstory to the toys that are Transformers. Again, another licensed property that, that how the world comes to Marvel was like make up a story and they do. So they're very successful. And in some ways they are in fact trying to hit every quadrant of the reading public. So in that regard, sort of funny animal comics, which were a long established part of comics made a lot of sense. But at the same time with that specialized comic book marketplace, right? That direct market where people are going to a comic shop and not buying comics off the newsstand means that they're trying to they're trying to tell stories for a comic book readership that knows comic books very well. And so you see this is a really complicated element. As I say, the history of comics says that there are literally thousands upon thousands of, of animal characters. Um, we have a project here at MSU. We have the largest, world's largest publicly accessible collection of comic books. And if you look at that, you visualize it, you'll see that funny animal comics are literally, we have like, Two million references, actually, you know, the funny animals and funny animal comics in terms of characters in our collection, uh, and there's a long history of funny animals in comics that starts from the very, very early newspaper comics. Like one of the most famous cartoons in the world was George Harriman. He created a character called Crazy Cat, and that was a funny animal comic. So in the history of comics, funny animals, talking animals, were a huge part of the early period of comics. Harriman used these characters, as many of the creators did, to tell stories that often reflected sort of commentary on the changing world. So they were comedic escape at some level for a newspaper reading audience of adults, but they also provided some often very interesting social commentary around race and class and so on and so forth. And so even in Crazy Cat, you can think about the cat as a black cat, the, the mouse as a white mouse, the bull pup, the bulldog, policeman being a kind of character on, on Irish identity in early America. And there's a really sort of complicated narrative around social construction buried in that. And we read comic books like comics like Crazy Cat as really interesting snapshots of American urbanism and American sort of ethno culture. And so the idea of a funny comic in itself isn't Animals in comics isn't that new. When we get to the superhero comic of the 19, late 1930s, we get introduced to Superman. Superman doesn't necessarily, that breaks from the sort of like early comic books that were produced before. Those were actually combinations. They were compilations of those newspaper comic strips. So incorporated in those very early comic strips before the superhero were funny animal comics. Those same strips that appeared in newspapers. With the superhero though, that is a phenomenon that transforms American comics. And you see a lot of very important uh, tropes associated with the format, that form of the comic book being developed in the, in the early period of the superhero. And in that context, you might have um, different genres being interpreted. Like you can think about Batman, the second superhero character as a merger between the, some of the tropes associated with the superhero character but also some of the previous character tropes like the detective comic or a pulp detective or uh, uh, adventure comics that adventure stories that involve masked men. Think of The Shadow, think of people like um, Doc Savage. And so a lot of these early stories that you find in Superman and Batman, these early golden age comic books actually use a lot of the same story elements that were present in print stories they get translated for the comic books as more and more publishers get involved and and the and the market rapidly expands they create they create more characters sponsored comics uh comic more companies come into the space they're they're creating they're publishing these these anthologies they're creating superheroes and 
other kinds of comics and this dominates the marketplace but as the war comes to an end we really have the superhero starting in 1930 by the time you get to the end of the war in 1944 1943 um you start to see other genres because superheroes aren't quite as popular and so you start to see the emergence of other genres and one of the genres that starts to get incorporated in this period is a return of the sort of funny animals and so if you look at this um this list of comics that are on the newsstand like 1943 i think this is 1943 uh you can see that there's you know millie the Malo, but if you look down there you can see their animal antics zoo funnies uh and in fact one of the major publishers of this period we almost forget now we might associate them with with science fiction but dell dell publisher had a very vigorous comic book publishing uh, legacy from the 1940s all the way to into the 1970s. And they published two different series of uh, really funny animal comics, but they're licensed material uh, from Walt Disney with the sort of like, you know, Daffy Duck and Mickey Mouse, but also uh, from Warner Brothers, sort of the Bugs Bunny. Um, Fawcett Comic actually introduced one of the earliest examples of a sort of like superhero funny animal hybrid uh, when um, uh, when they introduced funny animals in 1942 and then their you know timely comics which would become Marvel introduced Super Rabbit in 1943 right and so again comic books have a lot of different genres the superhero is the one that everyone knows but almost from the very beginning once the comic books became a, like a very vigorous market trying to search for different kind of readers meant that they returned to some of the ideas that were were present in earlier decades and try to incorporate them into this um hoppy the marvel bunny was in fact a character that was associated with captain marvel which at at one point in the 1940s was the most popular superhero comic in the world even more popular than superman which was an incredibly popular comic uh, as we go into the, the sort of period after the, the 50s to 60s into the 70s, one of the things that happens is that there are changing themes are associated with, with comics and a changing culture associated with comics. And comic books actually become less and less kid oriented. So one of the oddities of that period in the 1940s is there were a lot of adults reading comics, but there were a lot of kids reading comics. As we sort of move forward in time, comics have a juvenile lens, but really hardcore fans of comics are getting a little bit older. And this is one of the one of the ways that we sort of see an explosion of different formats. So the emergence of uh, the magazine format, like Marvel previews, introduces characters that are very important, even as and, and many of these characters like Star Lord or Nova or Rocket are going to be rediscovered later, but this is happening at the same time that you have a lot of adults really advocating for trying to tell more adult themed stories with comics. And ironically, there's a weird overlap here where if you think about some of the more successful comic book artists of the 1970s, someone like Art Spiegelman, someone like Robert Crumb, they often use animals, anamorphic tales to tell stories of people in very adult themes. So these are not funny animal stories but they're animal and anamorphic stories so they're they're starring like talking cats or talking dogs but they're very much in an adult landscape so oddly enough the the space where a kid can, inter, can inter, intersect with a, a comic that's about sort of like entertainment and humor gets very 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 narrow very very quickly in american comics and so it's only dc it's only um it's only walt disney it's only sort of warner brothers and those comics often are rightly or wrongly can't necessarily be easily acquired through a comic book shop and they they have to be found through sort of specialty outlets that aren't the comic book shop and the irony here is that the idea of the the comic book uh, as a medium for kids really is is being transformed by a reality of a much more sophisticated readership that is looking for different kinds of stories. Ironically, Rocket as a character, again, introduced in the pages of, of uh, 
the Marvel previews in the 1970s, along with a character like um, uh, Star Lord and and other characters. These these characters were for the long time only seen every once in a while, pretty much forgotten until the mid 2000s. And the version of Rocket that we know, the sort of like more hard bitten mercenary tactician military commander not necessarily fun loving was actually introduced in a, a marvel series called annihilation that was written by keith giffen this became uh, a, a kind of shared story event that brought together a lot of those random 1970s cosmic characters in marvel and put them together and modernized many of them and told the story with high stakes and actually spun off and really created a whole new audience for characters like Rocket. So the Rocket that we know today is a direct result of this sort of effort on the part of Marvel to sort of capitalize on the fact, well, we have all these characters that are cosmic characters, that are characters from space. Can we tell some kind of sort of like space opera-like story with them? And they do in, in the context of Annihilation, and that puts Rocket on the map. And that version of the Guardians of the Galaxy, because again, the Guardians of the Galaxies were the late 70s, early 80s that looked very different from what you saw on the screen. The version that we see in the MCU, the version that we see on the screen is the direct result of um, this annihilation storyline from the mid 2000s, like 2005, 2006. And so the version of these characters that we, we understand and, and, and are looking at are really a version from a much more modern take and reimagining of these sort of cosmic characters from the 70s. And this has opened the door to their inclusion in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and really set the stage for the sort of resurgence that we associate with Rocket Raccoon. So while I think of Rocket Raccoon as a character with a long and story connection to a broader set of uh, anamorphic, comedy-oriented stories related to animals, the reality is that that particular version that we know so well could really be traced directly back to a mid 2000s version of the character and kind of ignores this, this sort of comedic, sort of kid oriented version of animal stories that were so common in the early eras of superhero comics. I'm going to stop showing my screen and hope that I did that right. Hmm. Did I do that right? And I'm going to try to answer questions. Wonderful. Okay, so does any, if this is a great time for people to kind of pop in on your uh, window. There's a, a question mark. So if you want to pop in and ask some questions, uh, Dr. Chambers, that's awesome. I, I learned so much uh, from you. I do have a couple of questions that came up in our chat as you were presenting. The first one is, can you tell us about the relationship between animals and monsters in comics? Right, so one of the things that's really common, especially in those early years, is that a lot of the genres, like I said, like a lot of the genres we associate with comics are really pulling from print uh, pulp stories. So the sort of, sort of funny animal story uh, is a sort of comedic uh, tradition that you can find in newspaper and illustrated publications of the late the 19th century and the early 20th century. So think about newspaper cartoons, think about uh, illustrations, the political cartoons, things like that. The monster comic is actually more tightly associated with some of the genres you might associate with uh, pulp publications. So think about uh, weird tales, think about Assange story where characters like Conan or John Connor on Mars or Tarzan, where, they, where those characters are introduced. And so um, while both of those genres make their ways to comics, I think it's often important to recognize that the, the sort of satirical illustration that might use animals or people to make sort of political and social commentary, like a George Harriman in a newspaper comic strip, is a little bit different. You can trace it to a little bit different place versus a monster like a Frankenstein or like, you know, a Loch Ness Sea Monster, which you might more associate with um, pulp adventure stories where pirates and sort of like explorations and things like that are, are on display, like fantasy, sword and sorcery and fantasy characters were more prevalent. 
but both of them, because of some of the same writers are writing of those things, find their ways to comics as the genre explodes and more and more publishers are trying like, we need more comics because people are buying comics. It's a phenomenon. Can we get more comics from people? Or like, hey, can you guys write this thing? Like Batman was literally DC going like, this Superman thing is selling like hotcakes. Hey, can you make a character like Superman, Bob Kane? And he does. He borrows from um, like Douglas Fairbanks, who's a very famous movie star who you know does sort of, and like a character like uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel and like uh, like the the Bat, which was a like you know the Spider, which was a pulp character, and like eh, Batman, right? <laughs> and a lot of the early stories are very much like those stories you might find in a pulp magazine. Wonderful. Thank you. That's that's again very fascinating. This is uh, this is the topic that for me I I learned a lot about Rocket Raccoon from the movies. Obviously, do you think that that is harmful for the comics that a lot of us are introduced to these characters via the movies, or do you think that that helps the the comics and the genres in general? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that's important to recognize is that for a lot of these characters, if it wasn't for the movies, they would be a lot less well known. That's very true of Rocket, and it's very true pretty much of all the characters in the Guardian of the Galaxy movies. Like those are characters that at some level are obscure to the general public. So the version that you see on 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 film is a simplified translation of the comic book. In the case of of Rocket, like it is very much coming from that 2005 version. They're not at all concerned with these earlier versions from the 1980s or 1970s. And that gives that character um, life, right? Like, but if you're going to back to the old stuff, expecting it to be exactly like what you saw on film, sometimes that could be a little bit of a dichotomy. Um, it depends on the character, but Rocket, it would be a lot of a dichotomy, especially if you read the early stuff. But if you read the stuff from 2005, like, oh yeah, I could see how that character inspired a movie character. And so that's the only sort of like tension. If you're looking for the version you saw on film, it's important to look for a version that came, look for a comic that was published after the movie came out. Because one of the things that Marvel often does is that it will publish a comic after a movie comes out where the character looks and sounds a lot like the movie version of the character, like a lot more like the movie version of the character. Like if you look at Iron Man, the way they draw a, a Tony Stark now looks a lot more like Robert Downey Jr. than he used to like 20 years ago. And that's very deliberate because most people, when they think of Iron Man, they think of Robert Downey Jr. So, and they think of that the way Robert Downey Jr. sort of acts as Tony Stark. So the, the characterization of the character looks a lot like that characterization too. And that makes sense for them because they want more people to read comics. But there's literally, in a lot of cases, 50, 60, 70 years of comics that, that they're picking from to come up with these stories. So think of the movie as another version of the character. And if you really like the character, yeah, you should definitely check out those stories that inspire the movie but recognize that they might be a little bit different and you're going to be introduced to some of the sort of origin origin narratives that made that character that you see on screen. Wonderful. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point, you know, as as you're kind of starting to explore comics, you know, like I said, find the ones that are similar to you, the characters that you know and you feel that relationship with and then, you know, expand your knowledge of, of who they have been as a character. So very cool. I got one more question really here from the audience. Okay, go, go ahead. ahead. They often publish reading um, guys. Like, so if you want to know more about this character, uh, read these trade paperbacks. Uh, Marvel um, publishes a lot of those, like a reading order. And mo many of these comics you can get at your local library because they've been collected into like trade paperbacks. So they're at your local library. So if you go to marvel.com and you look at a character, They'll also have a reading order and they you can sort of find it at your local library. So you don't have to like buy all these back issues. You can stick it out from the library. Absolutely. Definitely check out your local library. So one more question for you real quick. Superhero, talk to me about superhero characters that have animal characteristics 
but they're not necessarily animals. <laughs> right. So there are a lot of uh, um, animalistic character character traits associated with characters. I mean, probably the most famous one of these is Wolverine, who is a very famous Marvel character who looks nothing like a Wolverine. Like at least the movie version, right? Hugh Jackman is six foot, I think six foot two. Uh, in comics, Wolverine is short. If you know comics, you know Jubilee is a short Asian. Wolverine is shorter than Jubilee. He is tiny, tiny. But he's named after a really aggressive Canadian animal, or you know, you know, upper northeast animal. That's one version. Probably a more common version is like uh, characters have uh, characters have animalistic abilities, like a squirrel girl. Um, I tend to think of these characters as as a lot of characters in fiction do, taking on the attributes of of a animal, like their abilities, but they don't necessarily they're not animalistic. Um, Wolverine has claws, but those are those are artificial claws, and he has a berserker race, but that has nothing to do with being a Wolverine. Wolverines are you know they're they're not crazy; they're just uh, territorially aggressive, right? Um, squirrel girl can talk to squirrels. The Falcon which is a very famous character, can talk to birds in comics. He can't do it in the movies, but in comics, Falcon can communicate with birds. So often, this is actually a really common trope that a character, through some sort of like um, accident or some sort of fluke of, of, of a charm or something, can get access to a sort of animal abilities. Famous character like Animal Man from DC Comics, who can mimic the abilities of different um, animals or vixen who has a totem that allows her to like have the ability of different animals this is a pretty common sort of thing in sort of speculative and fantasy literature but it's different from a sort of changeling character that changes into an animal for instance and these are sort of like minor sort of differences but they do make for um really important sort of distinctions about how those characters are presented sometimes those traits are used to comedic effect right and sometimes they could be used in terms of like horror, like think about a werewolf, right? That's a human that turns into an animal. And so these are old tropes that often depend on the genre that they're being presented in, offer different kinds of like story experiences for the audience. Wonderful. So thank you very much, Dr. Chambliss, for teaching us all about this. I feel like I have learned a lot. So again, thank you so much for joining the Hillsborough County Libraries. We really appreciate it. Again, we really encourage you guys, um, you know, to definitely check out Dr. Chamberlain. Um, you can find him at Julian Chamberlain at, uh, sorry, www.julianchamberlain.com. Um, if you want to contact us at Hillsborough County Libraries, uh, our number is 813-273. 3652. You can see all of our contact information. Uh, don't forget to check out our summer reading program. And we're really glad that you guys came to join us for this. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Chambliss. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And remember, you can always get a lot of the comics that I'm talking about through your local library. Just check them out. You don't have to worry about um, going back and, and uh, having to buy those back issues. Because a lot of these stuff been collected and freely available at your library. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, Matt, if you want to come back on and, and say goodbye to everybody, again, we appreciate you guys coming and joining us. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. All right. Thank you very much, Rain. Thank you, Dr. Chambliss. We appreciate it. Everybody have a wonderful evening and happy reading.